Early Rome is a topic that many historians, including Roman specialists, fear. The reason for this is simple. The history of early Rome is in many ways a mythological history. Up until about the First Punic War or so, the Romans were not keeping terribly detailed records, and as we'll see, it's quite possible that they were more or less making things up about some of their earlier history. That being said, while some of the events that we're about to discuss may have been invented, or perhaps they were simply exaggerated or forced to conform with ideas that Romans of later periods had about their own past, the fact is that these events that we're about to discuss were very much fundamental to the Roman understanding of themselves and of how they should approach the world around them. We will see the origin of many Roman institutions baked into their semi-mythological history. So let us discuss early Rome down to about the conquest of Italy in 265 BCE. This will give us a view of almost 500 years of Roman history. Uh, of course, it will become more accurate as we get closer to the mid third century. But again, the basic historicity in the modern sense is a little less important than the impact that it had on later Roman thinking. Rome is a city which is located on the top and between seven hills. As Rome developed over the course of this early period that we're studying today, it would come to encompass more and more of this area that you see on your screen. For whatever reason, whoever made this graphic of Rome and the Tiber River decided to shift the orientation to make the Tiber seem to flow north to south rather than east to west. But in reality, the Tiber should be flowing to the left and then Rome should be on the upper part of the bank in order to give you a proper sense of the direction of the compass. Nonetheless, this map does do a very good job of showing you both where all of the hills are located and the Field of Mars or Campus Martius as the Romans called it. In today's Rome, the Campus Martius is full of settlement and that was true from approximately the early empire on. That being said, in the early Republic and into the Middle Republic, the Campus Martius was used for exactly what it sounds like it was used for. When the Romans would call up troops, this is where troops would be marshaled and selected for campaigns. Men would be selected for the two legions that would be led out by the consuls, and they would all assemble at the Campus Martius to face conscription or get out of it and be sent home to their farms. The Forum is effectively the area between the hills, and that was actually the commercial district of Rome and where most of the plebs would live. The Forum is also where a lot of public business was conducted and where most of the law cases and speeches were given. Rome does not have direct access to the Mediterranean unless you count their little port on the Tiber as sea access. Rome is about 19 miles away from the Mediterranean coast and early on in its history it would develop a port at Ostia that it would use for its maritime needs. That being said, unlike most of the cities we've looked at in this course, Rome was not fundamentally a maritime power. In fact, as we'll see, Rome's orientation was so not orientated around the sea that at one point it considered moving the entire community further inland to the site of another city. From approximately 2000 down to 900 BCE, Italy was more or less culturally homogenous. It was dominated by a culture that archaeologists have labeled the Villanovan culture, and there weren't very many variations across the entirety of Italy. However, after 900, distinctive civilizations of Italic peoples would emerge. There were the Etruscans, the Umbrians, the Samnites, the Ligurians, the Sabines, and the Latins. Adding to the mix by about 700 or so were a bunch of Greek colonists who arrived in the south of Italy. Latium was the home of the Latins and it took its name from them, as did the language of the Latins, Latin. This is why when you want to learn about Roman history, if you want to become an expert, you need to learn Latin. This was the native language of the Romans. Confusingly, modern languages based on Latin are called Romance languages after Rome. They should really be called Latinate languages to keep things simple, but 
you know, I don't make these labels, so I don't get to decide such things. Latium is blessed with rich volcanic farmland, and it is one of the wealthier areas of Italy. It does not have the mineral wealth of Etruria, and the farmland is not quite so rich as Campania, but it is still doing quite well for itself, and it is a good potential power base. The richness of the soil will contribute to Roman success by helping it to sustain a large population. Rome will make constant war, and when you're making that kind of war, you do need a lot of bodies in the field. As for Rome's location in Latium, it is on the northern extremity of the Latin world. In fact, you could make a case for it actually really being part of Etruria. As a frontier city, Rome was exposed from an early date to contact with the Etruscans and with the Sabines. Now, the Romans were fundamentally Latin, and they would always identify more with their Latin cousins to the south of them than they would with any other people of Italy. That being said, the Romans did hold themselves to be somewhat separate and above even the Latins. And I think that this is because of their unique history as a frontier city, where there were always influxes of Etruscan and Sabine settlers. As for the Latin language, interestingly enough, it is more modern than you might think. The earliest examples of it date back only so far as the 8th century, and most of those are by attestation rather than being surviving examples. Before the early 3rd century, we know of no references to literary texts being written in Latin. In fact, educated Romans, when they had something to say at length rather than writing in their native language, would instead write in Greek, which was the international intellectual language. Even after literary Latin was developed, it would be a long time before most Romans would adopt their native language when they were writing in any kind of length. And even after the full development of Latin during the first century BCE, there were still Roman writers who sometimes preferred to use Greek. Marcus Aurelius's meditations are not written in Latin, but rather in Greek. So uh, that is something I find kind of interesting, how Latin is actually much later than you might think in terms of its written form. But, you know, that is just sort of a side note for your amusement. Before we get into the nitty gritty details of early Roman history such as we know them, I think that it's worth exploring the general historical problems that any new student of early Roman history will encounter from day one. The problem with early Roman history is that there is a great deal of variation in the surviving accounts of it. And the variations are caused by the degree to which early Roman historians from antiquity onward were free to use their imagination in recreating the past. They were free to basically say whatever they wanted because there wasn't a lot of solid information that would contradict whatever they might put forward. Early records that the Romans kept were destroyed during the Gallic sack of Rome in 390 BCE. This means that everything that we know about Rome prior to that date was probably based on an oral tradition that was written after 390. All of the written records before that were more or less lost. Another problem that confronts us is that the Romans do not seem to have been terribly interested in recording the details of their own history until the time of about the Second Punic War. And that seems like a remarkably late date given how powerful Rome was by that period. But the Romans, whatever they may have been, were not all that self-reflective of a people. The earliest known Roman historian, Quintus Fabius Pictor, only wrote his history of Rome during the Second Punic War. He was a kinsman and contemporary of the famous Fabius de Delaire, and it would appear that his work was widely read by the historians of the next couple of centuries, although it has not come down to us today. Interestingly enough, Fabius Pictor wrote in Greek. The first full portrait that we have of Rome's political system is a contemporary portrait from about the mid-2nd century BCE by the Greek historian Polybius who was living in Rome as a political hostage. His account of the Roman constitution records it at a specific moment in time. Polybius' description, while detailed and excellent, does not necessarily describe things as they were a hundred years before him, 
We don't know for sure what things were like 100 years before Polybius, but certainly we know there were differences. And we know for a fact that his conditions don't describe the Solon order or what came after it. You couldn't base an account of Caesar's times on Polybius's description of the Constitution because there were always changes to the Roman system over time, despite the Roman obsession with tradition. We can only imagine that this was always true, and our sources always give us indications that this was in fact the case, that Roman institutions changed fundamentally every few generations. Different offices were created or abolished, the number of magistrates increased, the number of senators increased, um, different people were granted rights of citizenship, different categories of citizenship existed. Rome was always in a state of change despite its conservative rhetoric about itself. There are also a number of telltale signs that when the Romans were given carte blanche to rewrite their early history to suit their own needs, that they looked to Greek history for ideas, and therefore they Hellenized certain elements of their own history. As we'll see, there are some very striking parallels between the stories of early Rome and con comparable histories of major Greek cities. If you're familiar with Roman culture and history, then you know that the Romans were very much interested in their Trojan ancestry. Fabius Pictor is the first person that we know of to add this element to Rome's past. Most likely, Fabius was inspired to do this by his love of Greek culture. As someone educated in Greek, he no doubt would have read Homer on many occasions, and he wanted his people, the Romans, to have a role in the Trojan diaspora. So, most likely, the tradition about Rome's Trojan origins was dated to about the 3rd century BCE and not before. The Romans, of course, chose the greatest of the Trojan champions as their ancestor, Aeneas. And the way that they do it, typically, although there's some variation, is that Aeneas founded Alba Longa and that Romulus and Remus were his descendants who then grew up at the site of Rome. The most common tradition among the Romans is that the city was founded in the year 753 BCE, which for them is the year 1 AUC, Ab Arba Condita from the foundation of the city. So if you want to know what year it is by AUC years, all you have to do is take the current year and add 753. We are currently living in the year 2773, by Roman standards at least, just so you know. Fabius Pictor, for his part, apparently thought that Rome was founded in 747 BCE, just to show you that there was some variation, even if 753 is the most commonly accepted of all these dates. The myth goes that Romulus and Remus were raised by a she-wolf who lived on one of the hills of Rome, and then they decided to found a city on the Palatine Hill, which then grew into Rome proper. The two wolf pup boys grew up, and eventually Romulus would murder Remus because this big empty space where a city could go was not big enough for the two of them. Had Remus killed Romulus instead, perhaps the city would have been known as Remoria. But that's not how things went. The city was called Rome. Romulus then declared himself king and managed to attract a large number of followers to his site. Most of the followers who came from the surrounding countryside to be with Romulus were unattached men, and perhaps it was this influx of random people which gave Rome its distinctive character and which made it Latin, but also distinct from the Latins, or at least this would be how later Romans might see it. The problem is that because he was attracting so many unattached men and not a lot of family men or women, Rome was a sausage party. So the Romans needed to find women in order to reproduce and keep their city going. In order to get wives, Romulus arranged for a festival to be held where large crowds would gather to celebrate, and then he and his men could seize Sabine women and then force them into becoming their wives. The Sabines are neighbors to the east of Rome who aren't all that far away. So Romulus and his men carry out this scheme. Naturally, even though they try to sue for peace immediately afterwards and they explain their problem, 
The Sabines do not have very generous ears to that problem, since these are their wives, daughters, and sisters being abducted. The Romulus manages to defeat two separate Sabine tribes and celebrate two triumphs in 752. However, after that, the king Titus Titius decided to come to Rome with a larger force of Sabines, and he was on the verge of overrunning the Romans on the Capitoline Hill when some of the Sabine women interceded in order to arrange a truce between their families and their new husbands, some of whom had already fathered children with them. So what ends up happening was a kind of intermixture of Romans and Sabines. They did this by creating a dual kingship shared for five years between Romulus and Titus Tadius, and after five years, Tadius died, and then Romulus became sole king. Apparently, the Sabines were content to just become Romans, although they did retain some of their identity for at least another couple of generations, at least if the stories about their next couple of kings are accurate. Romulus had founded a council of 100 men called the Senate, and this body was composed of the men who were the heads of the hundred leading families of Rome. Senate comes from the Latin word senatus, which means old man, so effectively the Senate was in theory a council of elders. In practice, of course, it was something of an aristocracy. The Romans claim that the Senate was entrusted with picking a new king to succeed Romulus upon his death. They settled on a Sabine guy named Numa Pompilius, who was a widower. His wife had been the daughter of the late Sabine king Titus Tadius, and he was someone who was universally admired for his wisdom and his virtue. He was elected soon after his wife's death, and he came back from mourning in order to serve as king. Apparently, he was not consulted, and he was simply told that he was now king and needed to report back to Rome at once. Numa Pompilius would serve from 715 to 673. In later Roman tradition, Numa Pompilius was something of the cultural founder of everything Roman. He was called a philosopher, and supposedly his works on philosophy were so profound that he had one of his texts buried with him, and in the year 181 it was uncovered in his tomb, and it was so dangerous that the Roman Senate ordered it burned. Most likely he never wrote any text and this never happened, but it does make for an interesting story and one has to wonder what would be so scandalous that it would cause the Senate to react in that way. Of course, there were other people at the time who thought that perhaps some of the ranking pontifices of Rome took the text and made it secret. Who knows? Numa is usually credited with founding most of Rome's religious practices and also laying down the norms of Roman religious life. The Romans attributed much of their success to their excellent relations with the gods and their very punctual observations of all of their festivals and sacrifice um, schedules. Numa supposedly founded the Pontifices, the Flamines, the Salii, the Fetiales, and other Roman religious orders. It was also Numa who created the Temple of Janus, which would open its gates when Rome was at peace and close them when Rome was at war. And he also started the origins, at least, of the Palmarian, the sacred boundary of Rome, inside of which you were not supposed to carry arms. He didn't quite institute the full Palmarium, but what he did do was lay out an idea that a certain amount of Rome was sacred or something along those lines. Exact Roman beliefs can sometimes be a little murky. Numa also is said to have imported the Vestal Virgins from the nearby city of Alba Longa and to have created the office of Pontifex Maximus, which during his time the kings held. Later on, it was an elected office, but an elected office for life. So um, effectively, while Romulus founded Rome, you could make an argument that Numa Pompilius is actually more important to Roman history since he gave Rome most of its distinctive cultural um, markers. Numa was so famous that one of the major curses in Rome would be to say Numa's balls to express your frustration at any given situation. <laughs> 
to recap, my argument at the outset of the video is that the Romans deliberately Hellenized their history in order to make it more resemble the history of Athens. If you think about Romulus, he was effectively like Theseus. He was more or less the founder of Roman civilization, but he did have some famous forebears who played a big role, just as Romulus was the descendant of Aeneas. If we move on down to Numa Pompilius, he's effectively the Solon of Rome. Solon is usually considered to be the chief lawgiver of the Athenian world, along with his predecessor Draco. But really, most laws in Athens were called the laws of Solon, just as many of the norms and laws of Rome would be called the laws of Numa. Where Rome deviates from the Athenian model is by having a total of seven kings. I presume that this number is no accident and that it was based on the sacred nature of the number seven. Let's look at kings three through six and their role in Roman history. Next up is Tullus Hostilius. He ruled for nearly 30 years and his reign was one of constant warfare against Rome's neighbors. His signal achievement was the conquest of Alba Longa, which some of the Romans regarded as effectively their mother city since it was the place that Aeneas had supposedly founded. After Tullus came Ancus Marcius. He ruled from 642 to 617 and he was one of the people who first started to expand Rome. So this shows that Romans were conscious of the fact that they had not originally inhabited all seven hills and that the city had grown over time. Supposedly it was Ancus Marcius who first settled the Aventine Hill. He began to conquer Latium and he also is given credit for founding the port of Ostia. Most likely that was actually a bit later than the time of Ancus Martius. After Ancus Martius, there was Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. Unlike the kings before him, Tarquinius Priscus was Etruscan. In the Roman tradition, he was elected fairly by the Roman people, or at least by the Roman Senate. So perhaps he settled there and they elected him in order to gain favor with the Etruscans to the north. Not only was he Etruscan by birth, but supposedly his father had been a Greek Demaratus of Corinth, meaning that Rome was now effectively conquered by the Etruscans. The Romans don't quite paint it that way. They put a different spin on it. But I think that it's easy to see that this record of having three Etruscan kings in a row does indicate where the power relations were orientated, at least from the Roman perspective. The Romans were not terribly forthcoming on the details of these arrangements and their relationship with the cities to their north. As for Tarquinius Priscus, he conquered more of Latium, and he also fought against both the Sabines and the Etruscans at various times, not all at the same time. He was a little more skilled than that. His successor was an other unrelated Etruscan named Servius Tullius, who ruled for nearly 40 years. There seems to have been a bit of an interregnum since the beginning of Servius Tullius's reign as supposedly 575. He apparently did a great deal for Rome. Later, the Romans will attribute to him the building of the so-called Servian walls, which protected early Rome from invaders. But most archaeologists believe that those walls dated to a full 200 years after his time. He is said to have enlarged Rome to three other hills, meaning that there must have been population growth during his time. That would make sense, actually, since we do know that the 6th and 5th and 4th centuries were a time of population growth in general in the ancient world. Servius Tullius also supposedly built temples to Diana and Fortuna and possibly created the first Roman coinage, although that is not nearly so clear. When it comes to temple building, we have seen in the north that the Etruscans were also building a lot of temples, especially starting in the 6th century. So actually all of this kind of adds up and seems semi-historical, even if the role of any individual king may not quite be accurate. The seventh and final king of Rome was the Etruscan Tarquinius Superbus. Despite what his name might seem to suggest to a modern English ear, Tarquinius Superbus was neither superb nor an excellent mode of public transportation. 
Superbus in Latin translates as the proud, the arrogant, the insolent, something along those lines. That is to say that in the Roman tradition, Tarquinius was a dick. Tarquinius Superbus ruled from 535 or so down to 509 BCE. Unlike his predecessors, all of whom were elected by the Senate, supposedly, Tarquinius Superbus, as the grandson of a previous ruler, Tarquinius Priscus, decided that Rome would be better off under his leadership, so he assassinated Servius Tullius and took support. He managed to rally a, a good amount of patrician support for his cause, but still, he was a usurper and a murderer, and that is how he came to power. One important facet of his rise to power is that it came through the patricians, which then gave them the idea that perhaps they could rule themselves. They could make and unmake kings, after all. It appears that most of Tarquinius Superbus's reign was successful, at least materially. He began construction of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill, a project that his grandfather had supposedly promised at one point. However, it would appear that the arrogance of Tarquinius Superbus was something that also afflicted his son and heir, Sextus Tarquinius. While the king Tarquinius was away on campaign, his son decided that he wanted a noblewoman, so he decided to rape the Roman noblewoman Lucretia. And this would cause some major problems for Superbus. Lucretia reported the rape to Roman noblemen and then committed suicide because she felt like her honor had been forever tarnished by the actions of the younger Tarquinius. This caused mass outrage among the nobles of Rome, and under the leadership of Lucius Junius Brutus, the nobles gathered together the people, and together they expelled the kings in 509 to 508 BCE. Tarquinius Superbus was shocked when he learned about this outcome, and he never accepted it. He worked with his Etruscan neighbors, including Lars Porcena, and later with members of the Latin League in order to try to restore his rule and bring Rome to heel. He would continue in these efforts all the way down to his death in 495. It seems like every year he was leading a different army against Rome in order to try to restore his power. Here we have a number of parallels with Athenian history, all of which taken together are way too close to be anything like coincidence. First of all, the assassination of one of Pisistratus' two sons occurred because he had insulted the honor of a pair of lovers. That pair of lovers, Harmodius and Aristogeiton, were both men, of course, but this is clearly an adaptation of that story. Just as in that story, this was a deed of rape which demanded vengeance, and that vengeance was delivered, and ultimately it was accompanied by a political revolution. In Athens, there was about a five-year gap between Harmodius and Aristogeiton killing Hipparchus, and then the Athenians finally getting rid of his brother Hippias after Hippias turned tyrannical due to paranoia about being killed. In Rome, this was expedited and simplified to where the Romans just rose up spontaneously in order to avenge the honor of the noblewoman Lucretia. So um, it's also interesting that the date that the Romans chose was exactly one year before the Athenians kicked out their leaders and started a democracy. So the Democratia of Cleisthenes was in 508 to 507 originally. Roman Republic dates to 509 to 508. As I said, the more ancient you make something, the more prestigious it was, so it's no coincidence that the Romans managed to make their Republic exactly one year older than Athenian Democratia. Further, just like Hippias of Athens, Tarquinius Superbus refused to give up on his throne, and he continued to engage in numerous machinations to reclaim it. Hippias even accompanied the Persian army which fought at Marathon because he was so eager to win back his power that he didn't care if he brought slavery upon all of Greece. Tarquinius Superbus was willing to subject the Romans to either rule by their fellow Latins or by the Etruscans in order to sustain his own power. So again, all of these parallels are far too close to be 
historical in the sense of actually occurring. And because the Romans did believe a lot of this, however, this is usually used as justification for the aristocratic hatred of all things monarchical. This is why the Roman senators would get extremely nervous if any one of their members became more prestigious than the body as a whole. This is why they feared royal ambition from people like Scipio Africanus and others, because they knew that if a new king were to take power, their own authority and prestige would be destroyed. And lo and behold, the rise of Augustus and his successors basically proved that to be correct. And it was this touchiness and this willingness to become martyrs in the name of the Republic, which led both Brutus and Cassius, Brutus being a descendant of Lucius Junius Brutus, to assassinate Caesar and proclaim themselves liberators of the Republic. Later on, Augustus will tread very lightly with the egos of the Roman nobles in order to make them feel that the Republic was still alive, and early emperors would repeat that because they didn't want to be stabbed over something dumb. Well, uh, all of this dates back to the Roman perception of their early history and how Roman senators felt about the kings. But it appears that the Romans were totally fine with their kings right up until Tarquinius's son got rapey. So again, if you actually take their tradition literally, it seems that one act of one king is what really turned them against monarchy and that everything else the kings did was apparently A-OK. -okay. I don't know. Kind of odd. Let's talk about the most famous structure of the early Republic, and really the only one that we know all that much about. This is the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the top of the Capitoline Hill. This was, without a doubt, the religious center of all of Rome. Jupiter Optimus Maximus means Jupiter the best and greatest. This was the most Trumpian name that they could think of, and of course, that is what they went with. How can you be better than the best and greatest? This temple was finished soon after the birth of the Republic. As I mentioned, it was one of the projects that Tarquinius Superbus had been working on, and it quickly set a new standard for temple architecture across the neighboring world. In fact, the Etruscans were very much impressed by this achievement, and they began to emulate it openly. The nearby Etruscan city of Veii, which is the nearest Etruscan city to Rome, was so enamored with the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus that its smaller Temple of Minerva, which the Etruscans spell with an E rather than an I, was basically a smaller scale copy of the Roman Temple to Jupiter. This temple was constructed using quite a bit of wood and it had to be maintained on the regular. Eventually, a fire claimed it in 83 BCE and it was only rebuilt in the year 69, but by that point, the Romans had moved on to Greek architectural norms and they were using Corinthian columns and all of that. Here's an artist reconstruction of what the original temple might have looked like. The Romans would have been utilizing more Etruscan stylings, so perhaps it would be something a little more along the lines of this. If you look at my video on the Etruscans, you can also see what some people think the temple at Veii looked like as well, just for the sake of comparison. A lot of this is based on guesswork from descriptions and sources. We don't have the full buildings, of course, but I think it's still useful and instructive to try to get a feel for what these things looked like. When the Republic was founded in 509 to 508, there were two orders in the city, the patricians and the plebeians, basically the haves and the have-nots. At the foundation of the Republic, the patrician families were those which were wealthy enough to hold power, and most of them were able to base their claim to power off of having held influence under the kings. So ironically, despite the fact that they were now ruling in their own name, and they were vehemently anti-monarchical. They dated, they sort of um, claimed their authority based on the fact that it had been granted at some point to their ancestors by kings, some of the, whom were actually Etruscan kings. So it's kind of a weird claim to authority. 
The original Senate of 100 members, which had been founded by Romulus, was still in effect, and now it was the governing body. If you were a senator or descendant of a senator, then you were eligible for election and membership in this body, and this is effectively what made you a patrician in the very early years of Rome. At least, that is how the story goes. Patricians, for their part, were highly protective of their privileges, and they claimed the monopoly on all political activity, at least for the first 20 or so years of the Republic. As we'll see, this quickly led to a conflict with the plebeians, many of whom had enough wealth to participate, but they simply lacked that status of having been appointed by the kings. We know a great deal about the ways that the Roman Republic operated during the Middle Republic, thanks to Polybius, and in the Late Republic, thanks mostly to Cicero. However, when it comes to the day-to-day -day operations of the Republic during the early period, we don't know all that much. We don't know, for instance, how many praetors there were. And we also don't know for sure whether the praetors or the consuls were the most important officials at the time. We're also not sure exactly how the Senate got from 100 to 300 members. All we know is that by the time of Polybius, it had enlarged to 300 members, and there were also more than two praetors. So clearly, Rome had gotten bigger and the need for more magistrates had led to the incorporation of more people into the Senate, but the exact process of that development is far from clear. The things we're about to look at in terms of the development of the Senate and the inclusion of the plebeians, this is something that we know mostly in sketch from later sources, and some of the accounts of how things happened maybe aren't 100% accurate. Certainly, they're not detailed enough to really follow blow by blow. What we do know is that in the early Republic, the praetors were probably more powerful than the consuls, and that changed over time, and that the common citizens, including plebeians with money, had effectively no power. All political decision-making lay with the patricians. And even as the patricians began to lose some of their ground, they continued to dominate the upper offices where the real power was. And it was only slowly and grudgingly that they helped, that they gave up the keys of the kingdom, as it were. But the only people who ultimately broke in the politics were not the plebeians as a whole, it was just the wealthy plebeians who then went on to become exactly like the patricians they had campaigned against. So the Roman Republic at heart was fundamentally an elitist organization and while some people have tried to claim it as a kind of democracy because they had elections, I think that that is optimistic thinking at best and it represents a fundamental naivete about the Roman mindset. The combination of patrician political dominance along with the constant warfare that they created led to a great deal of discontent among all of the plebs with their leadership. Common plebs wanted some kind of representation in government to avoid being forced to wage war constantly while reaping none of the benefits. Wealthy plebeians did not want to be permanently frozen out of the political system since they felt that they had just as much to contribute as did their patrician peers. So what this led to was a struggle of the orders which would last approximately from 494 to 287, and in fits and starts, what we would see is that over time, the plebeians would close the gap with the patricians to some extent. So in 494, what happened is that Rome had been at war constantly, especially against Veii, and when the patricians tried to call out another army, the plebs simply decided to secede from Rome, and they were going to march off and form their own city and let the patricians do things on their own. This, of course, forced the patricians to come to the negotiating table, and this began a series of concessions, which would culminate in 287, after at least one more secession of the plebs, where we had the political system that Polybius talks about. I'm not going to go into all of the details of these secessions, but basically the secessions were more or less what we would call today a general strike, and it involved all of the common people refusing to work or participate in government or the functions of society, not really government, until their demands were met. General strikes, by the way, are highly effective. 
So that is a political tool that people should take note of. At any rate, the end result of the secessions of the plebs over time is that by 287, a number of things had happened. One, all of the magistracies had opened up to plebeians, including the consulship. Two, the office of Tribune of the Plebs was created, and this would be held by 10 wealthy plebeians who were senators, and their job would be to protect the interests and persons of the commons. They would stand in the forum and people could approach them in order to receive aid. The tribunes were considered sacrosanct, so their persons could not be touched, and therefore if someone were running away from a more powerful adversary, they could go to the tribune of the plebs for protection, and the tribune might intercede on their behalf and protect them bodily. It's also possible that the tribunes could call one of the assemblies and pass laws without the Senate. This was rarely exercised since, of course, all these tribunes were members of the Senate, and most of them firmly believed in the superiority of the Senate as a decision-making body. Nonetheless, the assemblies technically did hold sovereignty after 287, and on some occasions they actually would exercise it. Over time, of course, those gains would recede, especially during the Second Punic War when the Senate became accustomed to simply making decisions without having to consult the people at all. So these reforms remained on the books, but were rarely used after the late third century. So when the Gracchi started reviving the assemblies, they technically were correct about the constitution of Rome. However, they were out of step with the times because this had not been done in about a hundred years. So another thing worth noting about um, this period and this conflict between the orders is that many historians will conclude happily that by the end of the conflict of the orders, being a patrician did not convey any great advantage, but that's simply false. Patricians were still much better positioned than plebeians in Roman politics. This is for a number of reasons. First of all, patricians could do the curses of Norum a full year or two younger than their plebeian colleagues. Second, Patrician name recognition was such that even if you were an impoverished patrician, you could get a wealthy bride simply because someone's dad would want to marry into your family because of the name and the prestige that held. Third, despite the fact that it doesn't make sense for Roman voters to favor people with famous family names, the fact is they did. Most poor plebeians preferred to vote for patricians than for wealthy plebeians unless those were first-generation plebeians on the make, i.e. new men. So yes, uh, there were a lot of advantages for patricians, not to mention that being a patrician made you eligible for certain priesthoods that plebeians could not apply for. One of the reasons why Julius Caesar was able to become Pontifex Maximus is because he only had to compete against fellow patricians, and he didn't have to compete against any of the prominent plebeians of his era. So. Um, Keep all of that in mind. Early Roman history contains a number of important events, including the Battle of the Caldine Forks, where the Samnites surrounded a Roman army and forced it to surrender, and then pass under the yoke, a humiliation that the Romans managed to avenge by defeating all of the Samnites and subjugating them. However, I think that without a doubt, the most important event in early Roman history was the Gallic sack of Rome. This is something that would have a cultural resonance which lasted throughout the entirety of Roman history. It also, of course, is responsible for our lack of solid knowledge about the early Republic and the period of the monarchy. At some point between 393 and 387, the most usual date is 390 because it's kind of just a consensus date, the Romans were heavily defeated in a battle against the Senones tribe. Uh, they were Gauls from the north of Italy or south of France under the chief Brennus. Brennus was then able to penetrate the city of Rome and sack everything outside of the Capitoline Hill. Supposedly, there were some old men who decided not to take refuge and they were so still and so calm that some of Brennus's men poked them to see if they were statues. And when one of them did that, the old man that he poked got really angry, picked up his walking stick, and whacked him on the head. 
This led to a slaughter of some of the oldest men in Rome, some of whom were probably senators. Well, at any rate, the Romans were forced to surrender and agree to pay an indemnity to get the Gauls to depart from Rome. When the Romans could not produce enough material wealth to meet the indemnity, they, but Brennus saw that they were close, so he threw his sword onto the pile in order to make it make weight on the scale. While this may have seemed like an act of generosity to Brennus himself, the Romans took this as a grave insult that they were unable to meet his demands. The Romans thought that they were always supposed to be able to live up to expectations. So to them, this was an intolerable insult, and this led to a visceral hatred of all things Gallic and also a deep-seated fear of another repeat of the sack of Rome. This is the source of the genocidal hatred that the Romans will hold toward the Gauls, and their classification of preemptive strikes as a part of us bellum, or just war. If you're wondering why the Romans were willing to give Marius so many back-to-back -back consulships, it's because they felt threatened by the Gauls. If you're wondering why the Romans read Caesar's commentaries where he basically describes genocide, he claims to have eliminated one-third of the Gauls, and they applauded him and voted unprecedented thanksgivings for those deeds, well, the reason is because of the legendary sack of Rome. So this is an event which did more to shape the Roman mind than any other in the early Republic, at least in my humble but right opinion. It took about 20 or 30 years for Rome to really recover from the sack of the Gauls, but eventually they recovered and then they got back to the task of conquering all of their neighbors. Over the next century or so, Rome would conquer all of her Italian foes in turn, as sometimes they would actually fight more than one of them at the same time, but by the time that their foes, the Samnites and the Etruscans, figured out that Rome was the power to beat in Italy, and therefore combined forces against them, it was too late and Rome was simply too strong. Rome did its toughest fighting against the Samnites and Pyrrhus of Epirus. The defeat at Caldine Forks at the hands of the Samnites was perhaps the most humiliating defeat in their history, although not the most costly. Pyrrhus of Epirus defeated Rome in two or three Pyrrhic victories. That is to say, he carried the field and technically won the day, but unlike the Romans, Pyrrhus was unable to replenish his losses, so in his third and final battle against the Romans, he was defeated. After the defeat of Pyrrhus, the Greek cities that had hired Pyrrhus fell one by one to Roman arms. The last of them fell to the Romans in the year 265 BCE. At this point, Rome was in charge of everything in Italy from the Po River in the north all the way to the tip of the boot. They were therefore bored and looking for new challenges. The next year, they were invited to enter into Sicily by the city of Masana, which was ruled by some mercenaries who happened to have come from Italy. They left Italy originally fleeing from Rome, but now that they were facing annihilation at the hands of the Carthaginians, they decided to renew their bonds of friendship and kinship with the Romans. This would lead to the First Punic War, but that is a different story for a different day since the First Punic War is the beginning of the Middle Republic.